Well, I'd like to pick up on, on your presentation. Um, on your last slide, you mentioned um, how Hollywood is in crisis right now, basically, because all the human writers are striking. And one of the big fights in the Hollywood um, writer strike is um, whether you should be allowed to use AI systems. And obviously, Hollywood studios want to use it, and writers don't, because I guess they're afraid of being replaced by an AI. What do you think of, their, uh, of the writers' concerns? And, and do you think there's a risk that we're automating away our, our creative jobs? Um, thank you. That's a fantastic question to be answering, uh, speaking as someone working in big tech. Um, <laughs> I'm very comfortable right now. I'm on the writer's side. Mm -hmm. I support the strike. Uh, I think that this is effectively uh, a manifestation of uh, an ugly side of capitalism. Um, I could joke that Hollywood has been automated 40 years ago already. Um, and that's because I'm French, you know, I like cinéma d'auteur. Uh, but yes, I, um, I think that there is a responsibility from pretty much everyone uh, in, our, on, in the industry uh, to make sure that um, they are uh, maintaining the conditions for, for creator, uh, creators and writers and, and all performers to, to subsist. So, it's so automating uh, writing is effectively shooting oneself in the foot because it's going to produce mediocre content at best uh, and, uh, and just impoverish the, the whole industry. Mm. Great answer. Uh, I, but um, that's being said, okay. if a writer wants to use it, why not? Mm. Uh, that's the whole point of our study. Um, it was to evaluate if uh, it can provide some sort of baseline. So, or maybe a counterexample. One of the people we interviewed in our study said that they would use that tool, they would, they would like to read the output of the tool much more than they would like to use it in the, in the process. And they want to read that output maybe to, to find some interesting glitches, if there are still some glitches, and that tends to happen with worse models, uh, or with better models, to simply find what's the average banal mediocre output, and maybe steer away from that in the process. Hmm. Now, you mentioned glitches. Can you think of maybe a funny example where an AI system has, has glitched or not worked in the way you didn't want to, um, and what it says about the limitation of this technology? Um, in theater? So, um, maybe that's because of you know, how we operate in our improv troupe, but um, very early on, um, we started uh, finishing our sentences and saying goodbye by saying BR. Mm -hmm. Who knows HTML? Yes. So, in HTML, when you to separate the line, the sentences, uh, you add BR. And I, I, I forgot to parse properly the text. <laughs> so well, they, they provided with, with you BR, and it like, became like a, a statement. I'm going away, BR. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but, so this is the sort of uh, cre silly creative inspiration that allows us to, uh, uh, to, to rebound our feet and, um, and, and to take forward. Mm. Um, now, John, in your presentation, you had a lot of examples of, of hallucination, which is industry jargon for when a large language models makes, makes stuff up. Um, now, how do you separate creativity, which is intentional hallucination, and, uh, well, hallucination and creativity? Because in some cases, you want that hallucination, and in others, like journalism, um, which is not a great use of a language model, um, in, <laughs> uh, you, you don't. You need, you need to have that 100% accuracy. So what do you... What yeah, do you do? it's down to purpose. If you want creativity, I don't think there is a difference. Mm. That it's like the old question of, is it art? Everything is art if you think it is. Hallucination is creativity if you like it. Mm. If it seems dumb, then it's hallucination. <laughs> so it's all down to the interpreter, I think, on, uh, on, on how, whether you call it creativity. It's from an upstream, on the actual generation side, it's indistinguishable. And um, you know, journalism is more of a special case where it's not strictly a creative industry. Um, the turn of phrase might be artistic, but the content is not. Mm. Um, so yes, as you say, language models don't really, they're, they're not the first port of call of where to go to if you're in a, a precision world. Right, so 
so yeah, so only you, so basically they're a great tool for creative things, but not much anything else. Uh, they, they have value in, the, in their capacity to deal with the noise of the real world. That's, you know, then outside of creative, that's I think their central strength, the ability to handle, you know, in, when you're writing HTML, everything has to be perfectly well structured, but our world is not perfectly well structured and data science in the real world is always the first, they always say 80% of it is getting your data straight because it's always junk <laughs> and it's got like weird things in it that you aren't expecting and the LLMs are really very good at dealing with weirdness in, in the real world. Mm. Um, I think I want to also take, slightly disagree with you about uh, job destruction Okay. <laughs> because I take the view that civilization has been destroying jobs for 10,000 years. That all technology has destroyed jobs. When we first put a fence around a cow and planted some seed, the hunter-gatherer said, what do I do now? And if writers, all they're doing is joining words together to make a nice sentence, then they deserve to be put out of work just as much as the hunter-gatherers have been. We've always, so far, found higher things to do. And if you're freed up from writing the sentences and you can work more on the plot or the narrative or the things that uh, are still a human domain, then that's a good thing to get rid of the people who just join words together. They'll find something better to do. <laughs> um, now, uh, Fridolin, uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed seeing a version of the metaverse that wasn't Mark Zuckerberg's bleak, uh, legless humans in a Zoom call. Um, but so how far away are we from that, from a metaverse? Like, how, what are the main hurdles stopping it? And yeah, when are we going to get it, basically? <laughs> well, <clears throat> in a sense, we have it, and in a sense, we don't have it at the same time. So clearly, as you can see from the technologies outline in my talk, there is still work to be done. There is improvements. There are improvements to be expected. Nevertheless, um, I think we're on a good way, and uh, with, with the bright minds in this room, for example, I'm sure we can um, get far ahead. I think what is much more difficult and tricky is I think these technologies are not available for everyone at the same time with the same speed and we're at danger of falling into a trap in which we're rolling out technologies to few instead of the many so just as an example there are or there have been um, investments by departments of defenses um, where we could have easily bought every single school in a big country like the US, I'm pretty sure it's the same in the UK too. We could have bought every single school a bunch of headsets um, a couple of years ago already and replaced them probably every year and, and see what, what comes from it. So I think there is a political request that we make sure we democratize these technologies and even if um, some of it is expensive still or hidden behind paywalls or requires a subscription, requires a 3,000 pound headset to operate, that we damn well make sure that we're not leaving people behind because otherwise we will end up in that situation where some people are out of job and not benefiting from the new jobs created where this skills gap exists and we're not able to bridge it quickly enough. Mm. And what would you say are the uses of of the metaverse, you know, especially thinking of a political priority, right? In the UK, we have the cost of living crisis, we have a war in Ukraine, you know, like, what is the use case of the metaverse that would really, like, how do you make it a political issue and, and use it? That's a very good question. <laughs> I think we're all expecting that there is a killer use case and there isn't. I think these technologies that go mainstream are, are no longer on a level of, of where is a single use case. There is a, a multitude of use cases and um, it diversifies, it can be used in different ways and I think we're slowly approaching the point with the metaverse technologies that we can do a lot of different things with them. We can connect uh, in unprecedented ways, we can bridge space and time in unprecedented ways. Um, if anything, I think the potential for education mm. and training, I think, are extremely appealing. And therefore, I would certainly hope that we make much more progress um, in that space. And um, speaking for the Open University, we, we've taken the right investments to do that. Mm. Super. Um, any questions in the audience, maybe on this side? Oh, uh, hand in the back. Uh, can you stand up, please? Yes. 
Um, a bit louder, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, question to the uh, My question is in terms of the actual management aspect of it. Uh, in terms of creating the fact that uh, what are your initiatives and what processes do you have in place to somebody in it regarding the whole thing? So, uh, could you talk about your processes, how you manage your time, and, and oh. right? Great. Yes, so it's a very collaborative process where we effectively want to get a good show out of it. So we are thinking about how the audience is going to, to receive it. And uh, we are guided by a um, multiplicity of uh, sometimes conflicting and sometimes well-aligned objectives. Uh, for instance, I want to do science communication. Uh, some of my partners in the, uh, in the team all just want to do a very nice show, and they are doing completely different shows on the side. So we, we kind of find a good agreement, uh, and, um, and then we, we just try it out. We, we, we try it out in, uh, in smaller venues, and then uh, uh, get coaches, uh, dramaturgs who review what we do. Um, and I think there is this um, importance of establishing some sort of bridges. I mean, it sounds really like a cliche, blurring boundaries, crossing borders, blah, 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 but it, it really resonates with me. Um, because it is effectively having a John goal and managing, managing to make it work. So it is, um, it's a bit of a messy process, really, <laughs> to be honest. Great. Um, any other questions in the audience? Oh, yeah? So study studies on on uh, robot scripts, or yeah, robot writing robots writing scripts of laughter and crying. Yes, um, yes. I think there is a, a fantastic researcher and. Um, Naomi, um, oh, uh, Naomi Wang, I think, um, at the University of Oregon, who is who has working who has worked specifically on timing and clapping uh, with a robot, uh, and uh, just the aspect of uh, she, just the aspect of timing was very hard to get to get through with. Or oh, she also worked with the timing of delivering a specific joke or uh, repeating the joke or moving forward. Um, and the feedback <coughs> comes exclusively from the audience and the amount of laughter <laughs> in the audience. And yeah, I mean, I guess uh, using a limited data set of a few dozens of performances, uh, you can try to get something out of it, yes. Super. Um, and this gentleman in the front has a question. Great. Well, thank you for your comments and thank you so much for your interesting presentations and, and this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.